There's a very infamous match of competitive Splatoon 3 in the losers finals between two of the best teams in Japan on Mincemeat Rainmaker. What should have been one of the most intense games out there ended up being a 5 minute stall fest with neither team getting past 61 on Rainmaker. This match put a spotlight on one of the biggest problems this game has in both competitive and casual, which is the maps. Today, with the help of FLC, one of the best Splatoon analysts out there, I want to cover why exactly the maps don't work and just how much they actually hurt this game, as well as if anything can be done about them in the future. This project took a lot of time, so if you like it, please consider subscribing. And with that being said, let's start with the main problem of these maps. Thanks Shara, and hello everyone. You guys might have seen people talking about the maps in Splatoon 3 being boring and simple and restrictive. They've been compared to Tetris pieces, for example. I usually just say that they're hallways. But what do people actually mean? when they say these things. Like, what's the problem with Splatoon 3's maps? Why is it a problem that the maps are hallways? Why do people want them changed? So, if we want to understand what the problem is with Splatoon 3's maps, I think we need to start by talking about choke points. Choke points are a fairly simple idea. It's just a part of the map where everyone on your team has to go through if you want to score points. A classic example of this is the ramp on Inkblot Rainmaker. You can go up the wall, you can go up the ramp, whatever, but you have to go through that part of the map and there are no other options. There's only two ways of dealing with a choke point in this game. The first is brute force. You use a whole bunch of specials and you overpower the defending team or you skip them entirely. So if you want to skip a choke point, basically what that means is you win a fight, say in mid, and by winning the fight there, the enemy team is respawning, which means you can just run straight through that choke point and then get situated in the enemy base before they can do anything about it. Right? And this is what we mean by skipping a choke point. If you don't skip that choke point, you're going to need specials and you're going to need them quickly. Because the longer the defending team has to get themselves sorted and start building their own specials, the less effective your specials are going to be by comparison. Like, you're going to start using specials, but then there's going to be specials flying right back at you that are going to halt your momentum as an attacking team. So in other words, choke points slow the game right down. This also affects the defending team, because the defenders not only have to just sit there and watch this choke point and build specials and try to deflect the enemy team's push, but also, if you're trying to flank, say through mid on Inkblood Art Academy, you can't get back to your base the moment you've started flanking. That one-way drop off the plat restricts restricts the defenders just as much as it restricts the attackers. So this means that there's very little incentive for either team to be active. There isn't really a good reason for either team to like try and fight into each other. There's not really any reason to move around and do things. The only thing that you really ought to be doing when the game starts stalling out is basically building special. Now, if you compare this to the tower control version of Inkblot, where that block lets you get up and down off your plat, well now suddenly, yes, of course it's going to make it so the attackers can flank you, but also it means that if you're a defender, you can drop off plat and fight in mid, but then also get back onto plat anytime you need to. It opens up the game for both teams. But the problem isn't just choke points. Choke points are fine, sort of in theory, right? Like they make it so that there's sort of an ebb and flow of the game's momentum, that's okay. The problem in Splatoon 3 is that it's not just that there's a choke point, it's that entire maps are choke points. Brinewater, Mincemeat, Hammerhead, the list goes on. And that is the problem with Splatoon 3's maps. So when we say things like the maps are hallways, this is what we're talking about. We're talking about this sense of restriction because the entire map is a choke point. This means that when you try to push forward, it's very linear. You're only going through the same part of the map over and over. There's no sense that you can like take an entire side of the map and then use that to sort of push the enemy team from two angles. The whole map feels like you're playing on Judd's turf war meter. Like you're going back and forth on that line that he uses to say which team won in turf war. You can't really do things aside from just hold forward and, and hope you gain ground. And I want to stress, this isn't just a competitive problem. This restrictiveness affects everybody. It doesn't matter whether you've just got the game for Christmas and you're playing the game for the first time, or you're a high 
high level competitive player. No matter what, it's going to make you feel stuck and restricted. It's going to make you feel as though nothing you do actually works. Everything's just getting shut down. It's going to make you feel terrible just sitting there watching the objective counter tick down. Meanwhile, you have to build this special that's probably not even going to work because it's too weak. You're going to feel like you have to actually fight no matter what. Whether you're a support player or you're trying to flank or you're an elite who's trying to hang back or anything like that, you're just going to have to fight. You're going to have to hit your shots. And it's going to feel as though because of that, you're just doing the same thing everyone else is doing. It doesn't feel like you have that much self expression doesn't feel like you get to play the way you want to play. It doesn't feel like picking a weapon does anything except restricts you if you pick the wrong one, you know? Some of these things are actually not that bad. Like, for example, I personally always liked playing, you know, just Deathmatch in Splatoon 2. But what I don't like is that in Splatoon 3, Deathmatch is the only thing I can do with a Tetra. You used to have different play styles that were open to you depending on the map and the enemy team's comp and your own comp and all that sort of stuff. You used to be able to strategize around this sort of stuff. But now, if you're playing Tetra, you're playing Quick Respawn. There is no alternative. You can't use a mobility-based playstyle. You can't use a slaying kind of playstyle. You are going to go 9 and 20, whether you like it or not. And this is why it's such a problem for the maps to be so restrictive and to be hallways. Many weapons are designed around the idea that you'll have different playstyles available to you through the game. So especially shorter range weapons, a lot of them are based around the idea that you're going to be sort of getting in and being mobile and sort of flanking and all that sort of stuff. But if there are no flanks, or if those flanks are entirely predictable, then entire classes of weapons just don't work anymore. Certainly not the way they're expected to work. That's why you end up being relegated to quick respawn. Because rather than flanking, the only thing you can do is just run headlong into the enemy team and hope that you get a couple of kills. Meanwhile, weapons that are sort of more stally, things like splatlings and whatnot, are able to basically sit there. They don't have to worry about flanks at all. They don't have to position very well because they can stand basically anywhere and cover the entire map. And so that means that they don't have a particularly interesting way of playing either, even if they are more effective. And then on top of that, the only way you can even deal with these weapons, normally you would be able to flank, but in these hallway maps, the only things you can do are use specials or spam quick respawn at the enemy team until they eventually fall apart. The problem that this creates is that because you have so few options, it means that it's a lot easier for each team to restrict the remaining options that the enemy team has. So if you're a defending team and you only have like two ways of getting out of your base, well those two ways are going to be really easily covered by say a Hydra or a bunch of point sensors or a burst bomb or a roller or anything to that effect. What if I came at the boulder from a different angle? No, that's the problem. You've got to stop thinking like an airbender. There's no different angle, no clever solution, no trickety trick that's gonna Whoa. move that rock. You've gotta face it head on. And then because this is so restrictive, the only options you really have at this point are either skipping these choke points repeatedly or just having such a strong set of specials that you can continually have a power spike that pushes you through all these various choke points through the map. Not to mention, all of this applies in reverse too. If you're fighting tooth and claw for every single step you take forward, well, if you start retreating voluntarily, if you're the last guy alive and you run backwards, oh boy, you're in for a world of hurt because not only is the enemy team all going to be piling into the same choke point you're trying to retreat through, which means whether they know you're there or not, they're going to find you and kill you. But also, because you're retreating, you're just giving up all the ground that you would have been able to cover for free. And this, of course, just reinforces what Quick Respawn is all about, which is whether you're taking a good fight or a bad fight, you need to get as deep into the enemy team's base as possible if you're going to go in like that. You either go in all the way or not at all. And if your weapon can't do either of those things, I'm sorry to say, but you just aren't picking the right weapon anymore. It's almost as if the game was originally being designed around much better and more open maps. And well, it was. If you go back to the first trailer and take a look at Scorch Gorge, it already looks pretty different. But the closer you look, the more drastic changes you see. The left side now is a fully inkable wall both teams can access. And the right side, while looking similar, is again another inkable wall rather than an uninkable one. The map 
map terrain near your spawn also features more options, including a lower route that can reach all the way to mid. And they stuck with this idea of map design for a while. In the second trailer, over half a year later, Eeltail is also even more drastically different. Not only is the map significantly wider with better terrain in your spawn, but there's access routes on the left and right side, both also featuring more inkable walls. Yeah, they really took a lot of these out in the final game. And if you go under the bridge, there's constantly routes on the left and right side there as well, on top of the bridge being a route in itself. The only other stage we saw at this time was Museum, one of the most open Splatoon 1 maps, and if it's the exact same Splatoon 1 layout like it is at this time, then it would have had this left route in ranked modes that open up the map even more, which was taken out in the final game. What's most interesting to me is not only would these maps have allowed more normal weapon diversity like FLC talked about earlier, but a lot of the ways the specials are designed in this game actually fit way better on these maps. Take Ink Vacuum and Reef Slider, for example. Both of these specials are really weak right now because they're very easy to get focused. If you vacuum to protect an area but everyone's there, it's very easy to fill the vacuum and kill it. Reef Slider faces a similar problem. It's great at forcing yourself through an area, but because it's somewhere everyone is, it's very easy to punish the special. But if you go to Old Eel Tail, a vacuum on a flank would have been a lot harder to stop, or punishing a Reef Slider going in because people would have been more spread out. Tacticooler is probably the best example though. Remember how a lot of pros thought it would be broken when we only had the Turf War layouts and only a few of the maps? Tacticooler is absolutely busted. <laughs> it is so much, it's insanely good. So Tacticooler at least one zap is gonna be bad. All four top level teams competing in the PAX Invitational that Nintendo hosted a few days before the game came out all had zap used in their team comps. People were that confident it was gonna be good. So why were they wrong? Well, it makes a lot more sense once the game came out and we realized that rather than coming from a variety of angles, you're just gonna be walking in front of people and something like a crab tank will mow you down regardless of any of the multiple buffs it gives you. This also applies for more powerful specials, Crab Tank, when it was first revealed, would not be able to cover the far left and right side of Eeltail, which greatly reduced its ability to control space. Finally, missiles would probably be the best example, as the more open and spread out the maps are, the harder it is to displace multiple people at the same time, making their relative power much more fair. Now, why did the devs go back on this map design in the first place? I'm not sure we'll ever know. Maybe they were worried about things being too overcomplicated, wanted the maps to be easier to understand at a glance, or really wanted this heavy choke point playstyle we have today. Whatever the reason, I can only point out that the game and the maps themselves are designed differently, and they clash with each other in a negative way. Sometime after that second trailer, and before the release date trailer where we saw Eeltail as it looks like today, is when this map design changed. You could even argue based off some, uh, balloon physics that don't make any sense on Mahi, as well as drastically different layouts, that some stages were even rushed at this point due to how little time they must have had with having to rework the first three ones. Regardless, it's clear that the map design changed and changed for the worse, but maybe the devs would be willing to go back on it. Splatoon 2 got a lot of map reworks that were able to make a lot of stages way better than they were previously, and if the flaws of the map design have become more apparent since launch and people have complained about it, it's possible that devs could also be reworking a lot of the stages in this game in the future. So rather than just pointing out the flaws of Splatoon 3's map design, with the help of Bipedal Squid, I went through to try to rework and find a compromise between the old open beta design and the bit more simplified designs we have today that could be realistic for the devs to rework in the future, for the most part. Before we get into those reworks though, they're going to feature a few changes to map mode combinations, and to talk about that, we need to cover how the maps also hurt how many of the modes feel in this game. Splat Zones is the simplest. This mode requires the most amount of ways to be able to go and contest the zone, because it's an objective that's so far back in the middle of the map and not moving like any of the other modes. Routes to contest it can allow teams to play around things that aren't special weapons, can give them options on retake, and force defenders to have to be a little bit more careful to rotate positions rather than just trying to hold one spot ahead of the zone the whole game. Tower control has three factors that are important. Most of all is preventing it from being stalled. Unlike the other modes where the defending team gets a passive special advantage to help them retake, the attacking team riding the tower actually gets special faster than the defenders. This means the tower should mostly be moving forward 
toward the enemy base and it doesn't go too far away into corners that can be very easy for the attacking team to stall and play around their specials. The second factor is having tower paths go to the side slightly. So for example on Hagglefish, the first checkpoint being in that corner means the right flank becomes a larger flank as the teams have to position closer to the side of the map. This is the main perk of tower control as it opens up the maps to be played in different ways based on where the tower is positioned and if it just goes straight through mid it doesn't give as many of these unique opportunities. Finally is a tower path that keeps jumps in mind. The best example for this is tower control on Mako Mark where the only way to go straight across to the top left side is when the tower is in that area between the first and second checkpoint. This is perfect for controlling the flow of the match as if attackers could get there before the first checkpoint it would be stupidly easy to clear while for the second checkpoint if they couldn't get up there it would be stupidly easy to defend. Basically it opens up new routes but it makes attackers earn it by having the tower in a specific spot in order to make it which works really well for the pacing of the mode. Rainmaker has two things to keep in mind. One is stalling locations. You don't want the attackers to be able to camp the Rainmaker in an annoying spot. Now Nintendo's actually mostly dealt with this by increasing the severity of do not retreat. However there are some spots we still want to account for such as the left side on Inkblot or Brinewater. Because you're not able to push through that side of the map you end up dropping the Rainmaker away from mid in a spot that's difficult to get because if you go for the Rainmaker the defending team can simply hold mid. This makes it really difficult to get the Rainmaker and get to mid to get your own push started and creates really stally matches if one team gets a good lead early on. The other factor is for attackers. You want to have paths that are dynamic and you are able to switch between them quickly. For example, a map mode that did this pretty well was Rainmaker Sturgeon in Splatoon 2 specifically. You have the left route, mid route, and right route, and an attacking sponge that, while risky, connects all of them, allowing you to switch between them and keeping it from being just one team and another team standing in a choke point trying to throw specials at each other. In Splatoon 3, they've removed that sponge, and that means switching between which push option you want to do takes a long time and leads to just being, okay, which side are we going to choose? All the defenders and attackers are going to stack here. Basically, for as much of the map as possible, you want to try to keep multiple options to move the Rainmaker as something that players can choose. And this also makes doing the objective significantly more fun than just, well, time to move left side on Inkblot Rainmaker because there's literally nowhere else I can choose. Finally, for Clam Blitz is two simpler factors. One, having the basket where power clams cannot be scored super safely. Sturgeon Shipyard is the main example for this as power clams can be scored with basically no risk. And the other important factor is clam spawns. You don't want too many of these too close to the basket because the team scoring should need to have to send someone back to recall more. Otherwise, it's too easy for one push to snowball the entire game. Mahi clams being an obvious example as there's a ton of spawns in mid which is basically right next to the basket. It's one toss away. Obviously, we are still trying to do compromises with the current map design intact, so not all of these problems will be adjusted in full, but we will be trying to reduce the severity of some of these things when we talk about specific map modes to make them flow a little bit better. So with that out of the way, let's see what these stages could look like if they were willing to make the maps just a little bit more open. First up is Scorch Gorge. The original layout has a lot of problems being very limited entrance routes, the spawn area being relatively weak, and a lack of routes to move around the stage. And so, introducing Scorch Gorge 2.0. There are a lot of changes here, so let's get started. The spawn region is going to be extended a bit to the left and the left defending side is going to be extended slightly, making it easier to hold these areas and making them less susceptible to bombs. It'll also have a slightly extended grading platform and a rail to be able to poke bombs more easily along the main choke, as well as a route underneath. Since this area is still going to be the main point of contention for the map, I wanted to give more options. On the right side of the stage, the spawn area is extended drastically with a great platform and making it way easier to retake the right side, but on top of that, it also allows allows you to drop into the flank from spawn, making it much safer. However, the main change is that the walls on the flank, both on the bottom left and the top right, will both be inkable, allowing you to go around the middle of the stage and giving a new option for teams to push. The final thing to note is that the tower in mid and the grating are going to be similar to their layout on clan blitz, and a bit of extra ground was added on the defensive snipe that allows mid-range weapons to poke top mid a bit more easily, though being at high risk. This layout might not be as open or easy to get out of spawn as the 
beta, but it provides significantly more options. Hello, thanks for having me on. Up next is Eel Tail Alley. In this gameplay trailer, we could clearly see just how much more open it was back in the day. It's baffling to how much was taken away in the final game. So our rework will focus on restoring it to this version without changing it too much from how it currently is. This stage suffers from being very tight. The bridge is a good lockout and the map can feel difficult to move on at times. So what it needs is to open up the sides a bit more and make it easier to move in general. There's not much change in the spawn region for Eel Tail's rework. The grate on the left was extended to make this defensive jump now possible, and the right side roof was widened just a bit. The biggest changes to this map were all in the middle. The bridge is now approachable from the top right side and the left side with this inkable wall, and the barrier walls to the stage were widened just a little bit, not only just to make the area bigger, but to also add routes around these two side platforms that used to just touch the wall. On top of that, in all modes besides flat zones, the bridge will be in the variation where it's dropped, allowing access from the middle of the map, making it easier to retain control over. In splat zones, however, the bridge will now keep its turf war variant, but now with walls on the sides similar to the dropped variant. The tower control route would be slightly changed in the mid to compensate for the changed bridge. The bridge is still the focal point, however making the stage wider, along with adding more consistent waves to attack the bridge, will make the stage flow a lot better. Hagglefish doesn't need as many changes compared to the others, as it already does have two side routes that just aren't as good as they should be, and so with this rework we're going to make them just a little bit better. Pretty simple, the sides are going to be a bit more similar to their layout and tower control with you being able to easily walk through the left and right side, but it'll now feature the block there that's in zones, allowing a lot more cover there. The sides have been widened just a little bit, and it'll be a bit easier to approach on both sides rather than requiring an awkward jump on one of them. On top of that, the wall next to the lowest part of the uninkable in mid will be climbable, but will require a squid surge to get up there, allowing a bit of a situational way to get into mid and opening up those options more. For some extra stuff, there's a bit of extended cover on the left side to make it a bit easier to retake that part of the map on tower control, and on the right side there'll be more sponges added so you can drop and go on the right flank without it being a one-way or a very slow retreat path. Undertow requires the least amount of changes, as the only real problem is that everyone is funneled into this very tight mid with no alternate routes, while the areas outside of that are actually really good. So there you go flanks. We decided on uninkable glass to make them easier to react to because of how quick these flanks are. And that paired with the giant glass that already exists, we believe it would be pretty fair for backlines to see coming. And since this opens it up on both sides, it drastically increases the amount of options. It is genuinely insane how just one small change can make a bad stage instantly good. Finally is the worst of the Splatoon 3 stages we've gotten so far, which is Mincemeat Metalworks. A lot of work needs to be done for this stage, but I think I'm pretty happy with what I came up with that requires the most minimal amount of changes. There's a good bit to talk about for this one. The spawn region has been extended slightly on the left side to make that choke point a bit easier to defend on on Rainmaker and Tower Control, and on top of that, a lot of routes are going to be opened up. This ramp and blocks are going to be there consistently on every mode. The top right side of your spawn will also allow you to drop more easily, and the grade path there has been shortened to make it a bit easier to move through for attackers and defenders, as well as the right side of your plat being extended and adding a little bit of cover. The most important change though is in mid. On the right side of your car, that wall that's normally uninkable will be inkable. And because we've extended that plat area a bit, if an attacker jumps there, they'll be able to move to their left side to be able to take a bit more of an angle. This opens up the stage drastically in mid and creates more push and flanking options, while the extended defending options allow it to be much easier for defenders to retake, making the map significantly more back and forth. Rhinewater is up next, a pretty small map that will be keeping pretty small just making the flanks better. First off, a pretty major spawn expansion because it's pretty hard to get out of sometimes in this map, especially from the right side, where the wall will no longer extend all the way, making it an actually useful spot. The drop will still be easily displaceable by bombs, but longer range weapons won't have to drop there anymore, and can use the snipe as an actual snipe. As for the flank, the rail will be there like it is in Clan Blitz because it's too good not to be included in every mode, along with the whole lower area getting a small expansion. This ramp will also no longer require a jump to get up, making it a faster and more reliable route. On top of that, both walls near the flank, both to get to the enemy base and to climb up to mid, will be inkable, making it much easier to traverse. The mid area is largely unchanged. Rhinewater just needs that right defensive route to be a better defensive route and the flank to be a better flank, which gives many more options for 
both sides. Also, we can't forget the tower control path will be slightly changed, lingering in this area longer instead of going straight to the opponent's spawn. Because this area is just not good to fight in, and the Rainmaker checkpoint was moved up, because why is it so close to mid? For Hammerhead Bridge, I'm not going to be bringing back the graded bridge from Splatoon 1, as I believe that falls under a rework that's too drastic since in lore the bridge is now completed. So instead, we're going to have to try to improve the stage how it is now. Funny enough though, most of these changes also come from Splatoon 1. The right side extension not only allows defenders an extra route out of spawn, but attackers a way to get up to the defending plat. There's a rail added in spawn, and finally, the walls that are added in mid as well as the extended plats are also from Splatoon 1, just rotated to provide a bit more cover from chargers. And this left wall will now be inkable, making it a two-way entrance, which both adds a flank for attackers and for defenders allows you to drop without instantly being cornered. Finally, it's worth noting this map is going to have a specific change for Rainmaker, where the checkpoints will be moved to be on the left and right side here. This creates two routes before they converge and keeps the checkpoint from being, well, way too close to mid. I think this stage actually ended up in a really cool hybrid between the Splatoon 1 and Splatoon 3 layouts that makes it feel like an actual completed version of Hammerhead Bridge. Museum honestly wasn't butchered that badly anyway, so I don't have too many changes here. The left side of the spawn area is going to be extended slightly to make it a bit easier to defend there on tower control, but the only major changes is that we're going to have the flank added back from Splatoon 1. This also includes the little wooden area underneath plat that you can use if you fail the direct jump. This opens up the stage drastically on retake since now going far left side altogether doesn't lock you in a corner and it makes it easier for attackers to push in via the added route. On Rainmaker, the checkpoint was moved back. The new route, while fast, requires you to move backward to climb a wall, jump, and then climb another wall, making it the most vulnerable Rainmaker path that's also the easiest for opponents to counter push if they stop you. Because of that, I believe it's fine to leave it in in this mode. The only other mode specific change is that the tower path will be modified slightly since the spinner is now blocking it from going straight forward. Mahi is definitely our personal favorite of all of these reworks. I am so sorry to all those who never played Splatoon 1 and this is your first ever time playing on the stage. Similar to Hammerhead Bridge, they completely gutted this map. Here's the original. And here's the brand new layout. Spawn was completely overhauled, now resembling an improved version of the Splatoon 1 version, with this whole area being unavailable to attackers. To allow defenders to retake the area more easily instead of being trapped almost instantly, the Splatoon 1 flank to defending snipe was also re-added, which adds a much needed extra approach option. The mid area had an expansion towards the islands like the original stage, while the islands themselves were restored, albeit just a bit more simplified. These two changes combined allow for the islands to act as viable approach options, and even allow you to use them to completely navigate around mid. This layout is a slight variation of one from my own channel I made a couple months back, so go check that out if you want to see more variations of Mahi Mahi. The tower path will go back to its Splatoon 1 route, except for that bit where it goes over water, and the water will still drop at the second checkpoint, while in Rainmaker the checkpoints will be spread out more evenly to also make the islands more useful, and of course will still trigger the water to drop. And finally, the clan blitz baskets would be right here, giving reason for the islands to exist. See a pattern here? This is just another instance of what we believe is the perfect mixture of the Splatoon 3 version with everything that made the Splatoon 1 version work, and it still manages to simplify things without taking away all the options. Flounder, of course, is one of the least butchered maps going to Splatoon 3, and already includes the spawn improvements that it needed. We have very few changes here. The right side, instead of having that pipe and uninkable wall, will now have it gone so you can climb up it. Though, unlike the Splatoon 1 version, this wall will still be blocked off. The low ground will be added back, with the tree returning in a slightly different place. This will add just a few more options. Plus, you know, it's a tree. It looks nice. And instead of this tunnel out of snipe that used to be very far back and give many options from spawn, it will now be brought back connected to your snipe and be a much simpler drop, just to get a little further to the right side. Again, not a stage that really needed a lot of changes, but a little bit of extra paths to the right just opens it up a little bit more. Inkblot Art Academy. A bit of a pain because of Rainmaker, but uh, we'll get to that Piranha Pit layout later. Anyway, first off is just going to be some small, simple changes. The layout takes most inspiration from tower control with a few notable changes. There will be glass added by the area to the rail, and that whole wall, both the front and the left side of it, will be inkable to make it much more easy to approach. There will also be a defending sponge added to the flanks to make them significantly less committal and much easier to use. Finally, since we made the attacking options way easier on the main choke point, the defending area will also have its spawn slightly extended to make it easier to defend. Splat zones only 
only change is it will now feature the middle block there like it normally does in that mode. And that just leaves Rainmaker. Extremely impossible to rework without drastically changing it due to just being one path. And so, uh, this is what we came up with. The entire layout's pretty much the same as the Tower and Clamblitz ones that I talked about further, but now the spawn area has been extended further backward and there's a new uninkable ramp added past the second checkpoint of the tower, near that main choke I mentioned previously. Basically, it's going to be made a bit more vertical. Checkpoint 1 will be moved back and an accompanying checkpoint will be on the right side, and now you can push through the left side eventually going up that new uninkable ramp, or on the right side, which while further will now feature the ramp being inkable, making it a bit easier. With the goal residing close to the enemy spawn, but with enough distance to be reasonable. Inkplot Rainmaker was something I thought we would just have to ignore entirely, but I think these changes are just realistic enough to where it might happen, especially considering Splatoon 2 Piranha Pit is a thing. Sturgeon's another map with a pretty good start. Mainly, the right route out of spawn is pretty good, and there's a decent amount of options. So it only needs a few fixes. And here it is. It's pretty much all on the left side of the map. With this grading platform extended, along with this whole lower area, this not only makes makes the already good right side route better by allowing easier access behind enemies, but it makes the admittedly pretty bad left option way easier to approach on, without having to climb the wall and instantly get surrounded. This block from the second game, which was mysteriously absent in Splatoon 3, has also been re-added. Rainmaker will have one specific mode change, being the return of the attacking sponge from Splatoon 2. This allowed you to easily switch between push options, and we have no idea why they took it out. Finally, the clan blitz layout was pretty bad since you were able to score from the snipe area, so Chara wanted to change it quite drastically. The clan basket will now be over here, just a little bit to the left of where the tower goal usually is. To make up for this, the attackers can now use the left flank like the cannon Rainmaker, and the right wall next to the basket will all be inkable now, allowing you to push slightly ahead of it. That being said, the defending spawn is a lot more locked off in this mode, to make it easier to defend against these variety of approach options, which can be difficult to hold onto with the basket in the corner, and we believe that change will make it feel a lot better. For Mako Mart, I pulled some inspiration from the Splatoon 1 flounder route I mentioned previously. Remember how Spawn had a tunnel that dropped you off in a bit of a two-way? That same tunnel is now there in Mako Mart. It's a little bit worse since it's obviously not as far back as it would be in Flounder, but this allows the right side to be much easier to push on, which is the main problem of the map. You have to move really far through a one-way drop, which will also feature a sponge to make that a little bit better, only to rush the enemy stack from low ground. With this being added, it'll now be easier to push on both sides of the map. The rail from tower control will be added there on all times because it's just cool, and I added an extra rail on the left side to make going all the way around in your spawn area more useful. It's still a bit of a situational flank since it doesn't put you in the greatest position and takes a long time to get there, but it's better than not being there at all. Finally, for Rainmaker, the spawn area was just extended to be a bit easier. The right tunnel is still there, though it's a lot harder to get there, so I think it evens it out a bit. And it's also worth noting, of course, that entire area is sitting in a Rainmaker free zone to avoid stalling. Wahoo World's an interesting interesting one, because not only did we want to make the stage better, but we also wanted to keep its gimmick intact in a way that does not make the stage obnoxious to play on, blocking off the main way into mid. So introducing the new and improved Wahoo World. Funny enough, most of the inspiration from this came from the Salmon Run Big Run layout of all things, mainly the right side having a block to climb instead of having to use the rail, and the left side having a way to climb up further. The bottom right half circle was also extended just a bit to the right and added cover to make it easier to retake and for attackers to hold. You may also have realized the left side now has the building interval with a table on the inside for cover. The glass walls and roof in the building will still be there. You'll just now be able to access it when coming from spawn, and it will be a one-way drop going to the flank, though the high ground here was extended so you can actually jump into the building from here. This would provide an interesting bit of cover while also keeping the flankers visible, as well as being a unique place for fights to occur. The rail will also still be there, but it will be moved to allow you to jump to the left side, meaning if you're defending from the right, you can more easily rotate to the left. The biggest change though is in mid. The bridge will no longer open and close and now always be open. Hallelujah. However, the carousel underneath the map will always be spinning. You'll still have the walls to climb up to reach the unequal flanks, but now there'll be arches similar to in Clamblitz and they'll no longer rotate with the carousel itself, being static and attached to the flanks. 
with the uninkable on the flanks being slightly reduced to make it easier to approach through. This gives Wahoo an abundance of approach options that we believe would make the stage feel really cool to play on. And now that the main gimmick is just the rotating carousel, it's much more interesting and accessible in more modes than just a few. And with that, that rounds up our reworks. Thank you so much. I had a great time collabing on this project. With everything being said, Splatoon 3 still does have a few good maps, and with DLC, even if we don't get reworks, it's likely that more good stages such as the Reef could be brought back with minimal enough changes to retain their good quality. And of course, Splatoon 3 is still a great game. This video is more to analyze why the maps don't work and why I think they should be changed, but many other attributes of the series are well designed enough to make up for it, and it's still fantastic. Regardless, even for my favorite game, I still try to critique it and be as fair as possible when assessing it. In my video covering the map design of Splatoon 2 being poor, I said that Splatoon 3 could have the best maps in the series. And while it's not off to a great start, there's still plenty of time to make that a reality. So I'll continue to remain hopeful that Splatoon 3 will have the best maps in the series. Hey everyone, sorry this video took so long to get out, it was just a massive project and I want to give a big thank you to FLC and by Pedalsquit for helping me out with this video. If you check the video description, you can also find an unlisted video going over a few extra map reworks that didn't make it into the video. And once again, thank you so much for watching.